Hello everyone, in today's video, we're going to take a look at HTTP status codes and going over all of the different codes that you need to know in order to develop web applications and web APIs to the best of your ability. Let's get started now. So if you're unfamiliar with HTTP status codes, essentially what they are is they're a way for the server to communicate with the browser in a really structured way so that both parties know exactly what's going on. A really common code that you've probably seen before is the 404 error, which essentially means not found. This happens if you try to go to a web page that doesn't exist, the server is going to give you a 404 error saying that the page you're looking for does not exist. And in order to go over all of the browser codes that you need to understand, the HTTP codes, I'm going to pull up a web page here that's going to show all the different available codes that you could think of, and I'm going to cover all of the ones you need to know and exactly what they mean. So here I am on a site on a web page called restapitutorials.com. I'm going to link it down in the description below for you to take a look at because it has really nice descriptions of all of these different status codes if you want to take a look and read in depth what each one actually means. But there are specific status codes that are much more important and more common than any of the other codes, and those are the ones I'm going to cover in this video, the ones that you really need to know to develop APIs and web pages. And I'm going to go by the categories, there's five different categories here we're going to cover, which is 100 to 500. And the starting category here is the 100 category, which is informational. You don't need to know any of these. Just pretend this category doesn't even exist. You're never going to use them building web APIs or websites. So just completely ignore this category. And we're going to move on to the 200 category, which is something you're going to see all the time. And essentially, any code in the 200 category section means that the request you made was a good request. It was successful. It completed correctly. It did what it was supposed to do. And the very basic version, just 200, it just means OK. This is a very general status code, which essentially says, OK, this request came to us. It was successful. I have nothing particular to say about it. It was just a successful request. So 200 is the most general success message you can send to people. And it's something you're going to see all of the time. The next most common 200 code you're going to see is the 201 status code. And if you're building a REST API, for example, all of your post requests to create resources, for example, create user, create item, create shopping cart, whatever it is, when you create something on an API, you want to return a 201 status code, which essentially says created. It just means you created some resource and it was successful. You could return a 200 status code, and technically that would be okay because they both mean okay, but sending a 201 gives the browser just a little bit more information so that they know that you actually created something and it wasn't just a general success message. The idea of these status codes is to give as much information to the browser as possible without actually having to do too much work because the status codes do the work for you. Another really popular status code is 204. And the 204 status code essentially means that you, something went well, everything worked as expected, but you have nothing to return. A lot of times if you have a delete request to an API and you want to delete a user, you don't have to return anything from the API call. The API server is not gonna give you information back because you just sent them an ID to delete and they deleted it. So they're gonna send you back a 204. And this 204 essentially says, we did what you wanted us to do, it went successful, and we have nothing to give back to you. So a lot of times if you don't return a 204 and you just return a 200, the browser or the person consuming your API might get confused because they'll say, okay, you gave me a good successful message, but you gave me nothing in return. Something must be broken. But with this 204 status code, what you're telling the person using your API is, we're not sending you anything, but that's okay. We aren't expecting to send you anything. Sending you nothing is exactly what we want to do. The next category of codes that we want to talk about are the 300 level status codes. And these handle if you want to redirect the user. So if someone goes to, for example, some website and that web page URL is redirecting them to another web page URL, you're going to get a 300 status code from the first URL that you go to, which is essentially saying, hey, this web page used to be here, but now it's over here. And there's a bunch of different codes to indicate different levels of redirection. But the main one that you want to know is this 304. And this actually isn't so much about redirecting the user from one URL to another, this is actually dealing with caching information. And so when you're calling an API, maybe you don't want to get all the results every time because they don't change that often. Maybe they change every couple of days, but you want to query it constantly just in case something changes, you want to be updated immediately. So what you can do is when you're calling that API, you send it up a message that says, 
has this been changed since X date, since yesterday, for example? And if it has not been changed since yesterday, the server sends back this 304 status, which says, nope, nothing has changed since yesterday, don't even worry about it. And then that way, the server doesn't have to send you any extra information, you don't have to download extra information, no extra work needs to be done because the server says, nope, nothing has changed since that date. But if, for example, the server information has changed since then, instead of sending you this 304, they're most likely going to send you some 200 level status and they're going to give you the information that you're looking for. So the idea of this 304 is just a way to save bandwidth. Essentially, instead of having to download everything every time to check if it's changed, the server will just tell you it hasn't changed and it won't give you anything. It'll just say, pull it from the cache that you have. Now that's all you really need to know about the 300 level errors. So we're going to move on to the 400 level section. And there's a bunch that you need to know in the 400 level section. A 400 level error is essentially an error from the client side. So the person using your API sent you either bad information, they aren't authorized, something along the lines of what the user sent you was bad, which is different than 500 level errors which is when something broke on the server. So everything the user sent you was correct, but the server itself that's running the API had some kind of error. Maybe the database is down. Maybe some kind of exception was thrown. That would be a 500 level error. And we're going to first focus on the 400 level errors because there's much more of them that you're going to return. And the first one is just the basic 400 error. This is just a general error that says something went wrong. Something happened. Your information was bad. And I'm telling you it's bad by sending you a 400. Generally, you only really use 400 errors when you don't know the specific reason for something being bad, or maybe the user just sent you bad parameters. So for example, if you want to create a new user and you need to pass a name and an email, and the client that's using the API only sent a name, they didn't send you the email, so that's a bad request. You send them back that 400 error saying, you didn't give me all the information I need because the name and email are required, so you send a 400 error. The other two common types of errors that you're going to see here is the 401 and the 403. These are very, very similar. There's unauthorized and then forbidden. A 401, which is the unauthorized error, essentially means you're trying to access something that requires some form of authentication. You must be logged in or you need an API key, something like that, but you didn't pass it. Or the one you passed was just incorrect. The server didn't know what you meant. So if you need an API key to access the API and you never send an API key, the server is going to respond with a 401 saying, I don't know who you are. You didn't give me an API key. You need to give me an API key. But a 403 would happen if the client sent an API key, but the service that they're accessing requires different permissions. Let's say that they're just a basic user and they tried to access an admin feature in the API. The server would give them a 403, which just says, I know who you are, but you do not have permission to access this. So I'm going to say you're forbidden from this with a 403. You cannot access this. You need to have better credentials, admin credentials, to access this section of the application. That's kind of the difference between 401 and 403. 401 says, I have no idea who you are. And 403 is saying, I know who you are, but you cannot access this, so go away. The other types of errors that you're going to see in the 400 section is going to be namely the 404 error, which is not found. This is the one I talked about at the beginning of the video. This just says that you're accessing some part of the web application, you're trying to at least, but that part does not exist. For example, if you have an application that has a user's API and someone tries to access a shopping cart API inside of it, there is no shopping cart API. So the server just says, I don't know what you want. We don't have this. So here's a 404. I can't find what you're looking for. And those are really the main 400 level errors that you're going to be running into. When it comes to 500 level errors, the really only one that you're going to worry about is this 500 error here, just the very generic 500 error, which is just saying something broke on the server. Usually when you have a problem with the server, it's a problem that you don't expect. For example, your code has a bug in it and it throws an error, or your database is down for some reason. It's not something you can really program around. So in general, when you throw a 500 error, it's because something bad happened that you did not expect to happen. So you're saying, I don't know what happened. The server is broken. Here's a 500 error. And the reason you send a 500 error when the server is broken is so the person using the API knows that what they're doing is not wrong. Because if they keep sending up requests and they keep getting 400 errors back, they'll think something with their code is wrong. When in actuality, if the server is broken, you need to send a 500 so the user knows, okay, the server is broken. It's not my fault. It's their fault. Hopefully they'll get it fixed for me. 
And that's all the basic HTTP status codes you need to know. Like I said, I'm going to link that site in the description below if you want to check out all of the other codes I didn't cover, but for all intents and purposes, those codes I covered are really all the codes that you're ever going to run across when building APIs. And if you enjoyed that video, make sure you subscribe to my channel and click the videos over here, which are similar to this video. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.